Well, let me add uh, my words of warm welcome to you on this snowy Friday uh, late morning. It's great to see you here. It's, uh, it's good to be together again. I know you've seen a lot of me this week. I, I won't be up here long, I promise. Happy Friday to you. It's good to be together. I want to take just a moment to introduce what we're going to do today and what we're going to do over the course of this semester. In addition to journeying together through the, through the letter of 1 John, and I want to take a moment just to encourage you, we're going to be in 1 John all semester, so when you have opportunity, why don't you sit down and read 1 John? Just read it. It won't actually take you that long to read through the whole thing. You can get a sense of what is happening there, so I encourage you to do that. But in addition to studying the book of 1 John, we're going to have a seven-part chapel series on the theme of vocation and discipleship. I'm aware, as you are, that um, many of us are anxious, worried, nervous, fretting over what we're going to do with the rest of our lives, what we're going to do when the blessed season of college life comes to an end. And I know for some of you that's not for a long time and, and some of you are still working on that, but it will come to an end at some point. Believe it or not, and I'm sure many of you would like to be gainfully employed, and not only gainfully employed, having jobs, earning some funds, but also finding work that matters and that brings you a sense of fulfillment and does something good in the world. And if you're not worried about that, I know your parents are. <laughs> So this semester, what we want to do in this series on vocation and discipleship is think about the ways in which, as we grow up to be disciples of Jesus Christ, often the biggest steps we take are when we come to find the sense of calling and vocation that God has placed on our lives and gifted each of us with. I know you're thinking about that and wondering about that, and we want to help lead you through that. And I am very excited that we begin this series today with a good colleague and friend, Dr. Con Campbell. He's going to kick this series off for us. Uh, Dr. Campbell is Associate Professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, many of you may know him from the classroom or from the jazz ensemble with his saxophone. Okay, so you've, you've, got, you've seen Dr. Campbell before. Uh, he's a great... Um, he's a great member of our community here who brings a whole range of gifts. And he's been working over the last year or so on a project considering the, the question of achievement and thinking about achievement from a, from a specifically biblical theological perspective. And so what he's going to share with us today in our chapel hour comes out of that, that research that he's done. But would you join me now in expressing thanks to have Dr. Campbell with us in this hour? Stand with me and let's unite our hearts in prayer as we continue in worship now. Let's ask for God's blessing on this hour and this semester and this journey that we embark on today. Thinking about what it means to be people that do work and do good work and work that matters in the world as disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we do come here to confess that you are our protector. You are our refuge. You are our shield. Without you, we are left exposed and vulnerable and subject to all sorts of danger and trial and anxiety and fear. But we also confess this morning that you, because of your great love for us in Christ Jesus, will indeed work all things to our good. Because you have called us and you have a purpose for each and every one of our lives. So God, we commit this time to you. We ask your blessing on this hour that we might come to know more fully and live into your calling on our lives, calling to be people that are productive, 
that do good work, that sow seeds of justice and human flourishing in the world, that aren't just after money or fame or reputation, but are actually building for your kingdom to come in our midst. Teach us, Lord. We need your wisdom. We need your help. We thank you for our brother. We pray for him even now that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit, that he might speak words of truth and words of life today. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise for it. We ask it in the strong name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading today is Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. Please turn in your Bibles if you would like to follow along. I will be reading from the New International Version. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work, and and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrust me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I, also, I, have, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you, have, that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even when they have, been, when they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. I love that ad. It's so funny. <laughs> and uh, it's clever. Because it taps into something true, I think, about American culture. I hope you don't take this personally. I'm not from America, in case you don't know that. (laughs) I think it's also true in Australia. But it's tapping into the question, why work hard? Why achieve things? Why give yourself to the pursuit of excellence? And the answer that the ad gives first is, well, it's not for stuff, right? Like the swimming pool. It's to achieve amazing things, like going to the moon and inventing a car that is eco-friendly. And then at the end he says, and it's also about the stuff. That's what many people in our culture think. That's how they operate. That's what motivates them to work hard. That's what motivates them to achieve. To achieve great things and to buy neat stuff. But how should we think about work? How should we think about achievement? If we are believers in Jesus Christ, if we are submitted to his word, what does the Bible tell us about these things? Well, I'm going to explore the theme of achievement in a brief way this morning by looking at two texts. The second was read out for us very well just a moment ago from Matthew 25, the well-known parable of the talents. But the first text I want to look at is from Ecclesiastes. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to this book. This is one of my favorite books in the Bible. If you're allowed to have favorites, you know, okay, I just really like this book. How about that? And it is unlike any other book in the Bible, 
you read Ecclesiastes and you think, how did that get in the Bible? It is so surprising that this book is here. Like the book that follows it, the Song of Songs, you read it and you go, how is that in the Bible? If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't read it now, because you will not be able to listen to the rest of my talk. Read it later on. But Ecclesiastes, he is wrestling with some big questions. The preacher, the Hebrew term Kohelet, the preacher who is teaching through this book, he's wrestling with some big questions. And the fundamental reality that casts its shadow over all human life under the sun, that's all human life in the world that we can observe, is this. We're all going to die one day. We're all going to die. Now, I know who I'm talking to right now. Okay, If you have not hit the age of 30, and that's most of you, you do not yet really believe that you're going to die one day. I mean, you might know it intellectually, but you don't know it experientially. You're at the prime of your life. You think it's just going to keep on going, getting better and better and better. Well, it's going to get better for a while, and then it's going to go downhill fast. You wake up one day in your 30s and you think, how the heck did that happen? And there's nothing you can do to reverse it. There's nothing. You're on a downward slide that's going to end in death. <laughs> it's an upbeat book. And Kohelet wrestles with the issue of, th of work. This is one of the big themes he wrestles with. What is the meaning and significance of work given that fact that we are going to die? What is the significance of our achievements given the fact that everything ends in death? So pick it up with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Actually, the way he begins this section is not with achievement. He first tries an experiment, kind of anti-achievement experiment. He tries living it up, just living the good life, and chasing pleasure. So that begins chapter 2. He says, I said to myself, go ahead, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy what is good. But it turned out to be futile. I said about laughter, it is madness. And about pleasure, what does this accomplish? I explored with my mind how to let my body enjoy life with wine and how to grasp folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom until I could see what is good for people to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. In other words, he said, I'm going to try this. Let's see if this gives meaning to my fleeting life. Have a good time. Drink wine. Relax. It kind of sounds good, to be honest with you. It's Friday at the end of a busy week. I always feel basically catatonic by a Friday afternoon. And I look at my dog. And what does my dog do? I think my dog has a better life than me. My dog sleeps 16 hours a day. And even when she's not asleep, she's resting with her eyes shut. <laughs> and we pamper her and give her cuddles and take her for walks and give her food. And I think, man, you have got it made. But then I try that, you know, Friday afternoon or maybe on the weekend, just chill out on the couch and do nothing. And the reality is after a while, after my batteries have been recharged, I need to do something. Taking it easy, seeking pleasure is not the answer in life. You know that, right? In the end, it becomes very disillusioning. It's good to rest, but it's not good to live an entire life where all you do is rest. And so Kohelet gives up on that idea pretty quickly, and he goes to quite the opposite extreme. Verse 4, I increased my achievements. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself and planted every kind of fruit tree in them. I constructed reservoirs of water for myself from which to irrigate a grove of flourishing trees. I acquired male and female servants and had slaves who were born in my house. I also owned many herds of cattle and flocks, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I also amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I gathered male and female singers for myself and many concubines for the delights of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also remained with me. All that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. 
I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. This was my reward for my struggles. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. The word that's translated there, futile, is like mist, smoke, vapor. I mean, Kohelet lives the American dream. He sets out to achieve the greatest things, and he becomes the greatest achiever in the history of his people. And then he sits back and says, but you know what? It's all nothing. It doesn't satisfy him. It's not the answer in the end. And I don't know if you've experienced that, where you've chased after a goal, you've set your mind to some great achievement, and there is enjoyment in the struggle. You know, climbing the mountain, that's the best part. But have you ever experienced actually getting to the top, and you realize, well, there's nothing really there? Maybe you experience a kind of empty feeling. And it's not what you anticipate. You think it's going to be awesome. You think everyone's going to give you high fives. You think everyone's going to shout from the rooftops what a great achievement you made. But you end up feeling like, oh, OK, well, what's next? I have a, a uh, confession to make. I'm a self-confessed achievement junkie. I like the, the pursuit. I like climbing the mountain. The bigger, the harder the goal, the longer it takes, the better. Chipping away at it every day, it's a great sense of adventure and fun and getting something done. Hopefully something that is of use to other people. But I learned pretty quickly in life that once you get it, once you achieve it, it's not really what you're looking for. The most profound experience of this earlier in my life was when I was about your age, a bit younger than some maybe. When I was, just backing up a bit, when I was 16, I got really into jazz. I loved jazz, playing the jazz saxophone, and all I wanted to do was be a professional jazz musician, and I set my goal to do that, but one of my goals on the way there was to try to win this prestigious award in jazz in Australia. It's called the James Morrison Jazz Scholarship, open to any jazz musician of any instrument of the age of 19 or under. Now, when I was 16, that was a huge goal because I'd heard some of the previous winners of this scholarship, and they were phenomenal musicians. But I thought, I'm going to try, and I chipped away every day, practicing four hours, five hours, six hours every day. That was my goal. Didn't care about school, didn't do any schoolwork. Not recommending that, by the way. But <laughs> pursuing the goal single-mindedly. And then the day came. I was 19. I got the call. I was one of the six finalists in the country to compete for the James Morrison Jazz Scholarship. They flew us all to South Australia to perform at a jazz festival with thousands of people, and we would play off for this prize. Well, I won. I achieved my goal. But you know what happened? It was almost immediate. They called my name from the stage. I came up on the stage. We were going to perform a number together with Australia's most famous jazz musician, James Morrison. And before that happened, I was waiting backstage, and he was talking about some other things. And I went outside out the back door for, for a second. And I remember this so clearly. I had just won the James Morrison Jazz Scholarship. It had been my goal for three years that I'd been pursuing. And I was thinking, why doesn't it feel better than this? And I was kind of rebuking myself, saying, don't be an idiot. Enjoy it. Enjoy the moment. Celebrate. But I was just like, I just felt empty. It wasn't what I thought it would be. It didn't deliver. And I learned an, an important lesson there. It might be good to achieve. It might be good to accomplish things. But it will not deliver what we are all looking for. It will not give meaning to our lives. It will not make us worthwhile as people. It's not meant to do that. And that's what Kohelet realizes. 
He does it all, and then he says, it's all futile. It's just mist. It's just smoke. And then he really hates the fact that you're going to die and leave all the fruit of your work to someone else. Over in verse 18, he says, I hated all my work that I labored under the sun because I must leave it to the man who comes after me. And who knows whether he'll be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will take over all my work that I labored at skillfully under the sun. This too is futile. So I began to give myself over to despair concerning all my work that I labored at under the sun. When there is a man whose work was done with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and he must give his portion to a man who has not worked for it, this too is futile and a great wrong. What does a man get with all his work and all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? That's a theme question of the book. And the answer is nothing. What do you get? You get nothing. Because it's all going to be taken away from you at death. We need to come to terms with the reality of death and how it shapes life. They say in you know, various business models, start with the end in mind, right? Well, the end is death. So live in light of that fact that you're going to die one day. What sort of life do you want to live knowing that fact? And it puts an interesting perspective on our work, doesn't it? Because you might build a building like Kohelet does, but you know one day it's going to fall down. And you might become a doctor and save lives, but the reality is you're not really saving lives, you're just prolonging life, aren't you? Because they're all going to die too, aren't they? And if you're a teacher, what a noble profession, but all your students are going to be dead one day. You write a book. No one's going to be reading it in 50 years. <laughs> very few exceptions. Very few exceptions. It's just a fact. So what do we do with that? Well, the thing is, Kohelet, what he says is true to a certain extent. Everything that he observes is under the sun. And that's because of the time when it was written. Now God's word, it's, God reveals his plans over time. And in this period of Israel's history, he had not given a very clear view of what laid for us after death, what the afterlife would look like. I think Kohelet knows there's something, but he doesn't know what it is. All he can see is death and how that makes everything futile. But as the Old Testament progresses, we start to see more and more of what God has in plan for our future, creating a new heavens and a new earth, and what life will be like after death. And of course, we get to the New Testament, where that comes to full bloom. And so now, let's turn to Matthew 25 and look again at that parable of the talents. I think this parable does not contradict what Ecclesiastes says. It complements it. But you have to understand that Ecclesiastes, the view is limited. Whereas what we get with this parable that Jesus speaks is an inside look into how life after death affects very much how we should think about work and achievement. So let me just read it to you again. I'm actually reading from a different version, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and it changes a few things. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 14. For it is just like a man going on a journey. He called his own slaves and turned over his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who'd received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man who uh, with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. I'm sure it's a very familiar story. By the way, a couple of things to note. The context of this parable is that it's the last in a series of parables about the return of Jesus. And how believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus, must be ready in anticipation for Jesus' return. 
So the master who goes away and comes back is clearly talking about Jesus. The other thing to note is that a talent, a little strange for us perhaps, but in the ancient world, a talent is a huge sum of money. Approximately equivalent to around $800,000 today. So five talents is a lot of money. Okay. Now verse 19, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The man who'd received five talents approached, presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I have five more. I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Same thing ha happens with the guy with two talents. Then verse 24. Then the man who'd received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a difficult man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. Look, you have what is yours. But his master replied to him, You evil, lazy slave. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers. And when I returned, I would have received my money back with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good-for-nothing slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We'll come back to that bit in a moment. The main point of the parable is that Jesus is returning, and in the meantime, he has entrusted us with things that he expects us to work. In the parable, it's obviously money. It's material wealth. But the parable is teaching us, I think, that Everything that God has given to us in this life is ultimately entrusted to us by Him and it belongs to Him and we are to work it for Him. Think about your gifts. What are you gifted at? Maybe you have a sharp mind. Maybe you can play the saxophone like Taylor. Maybe you're a great sportsman. Maybe you uh, have wonderful creative writing skills. What gifts, what abilities has God given to you? But not only your gifts, not only your abilities, but your opportunities. The opportunities that he's given us to exercise those gifts, to use those gifts and abilities. What are they for you? They're different for everybody. And they change over time. Realize that those things have been entrusted to you. They do not belong to you. And so, one, there is no reason for pride. You might be the smartest person in the room. Well, that's true. That's not true for everyone except one person. But you might think you are. Doesn't matter. You cannot take pride in your intelligence. You cannot take pride in your musical ability or your sporting prowess your, or your creative writing skills or your ability to teach and explain things clearly to others. That's been given to you. That's a gift. And the gift, second, is not for you. It's for other people. The Lord wants us to use these gifts that he's given, that he's entrusted to us, for the sake of others, for the betterment of the world, the people living around us, and ultimately for the glory of God. That's what they're for. But what about this scary part of the parable? The lazy slave. What does he do that's so wrong? He says, in verse 24, I know you, you're a difficult man, and I was afraid. He feared his master. Now, if this is talking about ultimately about God... Well, it's actually right to fear God, isn't it? The Bible tells us consistently to fear the Lord. What it means is have deep 
reverence and respect for Him. Be awestruck by Him. But the problem, the problem that this slave has is not that he fears the master. Actually, the master seems to endorse his fear. It's that his fear causes him to be paralyzed. His fear causes him to sit on his hands and do nothing because he's afraid. Whereas what we see in the Bible is the fear of the Lord ought to prompt us to serve him. It ought to prompt us to offer him the fruit of our lives and our work and our achievement. And so he makes the wrong response. And the punishment seems kind of harsh, but I think what's happening here is Jesus has, right at the end of the parallel, stepped out of parable moment, uh, mode for a moment. So whereas the story was all couched in this story about a master going away, when he talks about the weeping and gnashing of teeth, he is talking about being alienated from Jesus when Jesus returns. Which means what we do with the lives that God has entrusted to us really does matter to him. It really does matter. What I want to say to you about this point is, some of you may be anxious about what the future might hold for you. Some of you might be worried and not sure about what God has got in store for you. Here's my advice. Look at what God has entrusted and work it. Do something with what God has given to you. Don't sit on your hands. Don't be paralyzed by your anxiety or your fear. Sometimes Christians fall into that trap. I wish I, wish I knew what the Lord wanted me to do so I could do what the Lord wants me to do. And as a result, you can't make decisions because I don't want to make a wrong choice. And you put extra pressure on yourself that unbelievers don't actually have because they're not worried about trying to please the Lord. Here's the thing. Just chill out. Trust God. He's entrusted these things to you for a purpose, and you may not know what those purposes are yet. That's okay. He does. And he will bring it about one way or another. So be faithful. Be a good steward with what's been entrusted to you. And let the rest simply emerge. You don't have to know ahead of time. You don't need to second guess God. He's sovereign. His plan is going to happen. There's nothing you can do to avoid it anyway. So just go ahead, trust Him, and be faithful. I can tell you, when I was a music student, I had no clue that one day I would be standing here in front of you all at Trinity Chapel. Not a clue. But I'm glad that I'm here. And God did not waste any of that time. He was shaping me. He was forming me. I learned life lessons from music. I learned how to think creatively, how to improvise, which is kind of what I'm doing right now. (laughs) To see patterns, to think intuitively, He was shaping me for what I would do in the future. And most of all, he was shaping me to lead the Trinity Jazz Ensemble. (laughs) So just be a good steward. Don't worry too much. Trust God. Finally, final point. Notice what the master says to the first two slaves. He says three things. Well done, good and faithful slave. What is going to be better than hearing those words from the Lord Jesus when you meet him face to face. What could possibly be better? Having a commendation from the Lord for the way that you have lived your life. Second, you are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Your faithfulness in this life has implications for what you will be doing in the new heavens and the new earth. We don't know what that means. We don't know what that looks like. That Jesus may have jobs for us to do in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know. Nobody knows. But there's something there. And what we do now makes a difference then. 
And finally, and I think this is most important, he says, come and share your master's joy. He is not a harsh taskmaster just sending his slaves out to do a job and then reaping all the benefits without any care for the slaves. He wants to be with us. And we're going to share in joyous fellowship with him, rejoicing for all eternity in his goodness, his love for us, and the way that he has enabled us to serve him and bring about his purposes. Sharing in the master's joy. That's what we have to look forward to beyond death. That's why our work and our achievements and our striving for excellence matters now. Because we want to hear the commendation from our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, good and faithful slave. Let's share in this joy together for all eternity. That's why. He's entrusted us with gifts that will help people, help the world, and bring about God's purposes bringing honor to him. So let's pray that God would enable us to be faithful stewards. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being, as the New Testament calls us, your co-workers, that you have entrusted us with gifts, abilities, and opportunities. May we fan them into flame. May we do them as to the Lord. May we be found faithful on that day. We look forward to sharing in your joy with us. May that spur us on and motivate us and give meaning and significance to all our work, whatever it may be. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please rise and receive this benediction? To this end, I bless you in the name of the Lord, that the Lord may make you worthy of his calling, fulfilling every good resolve and work of faith by his power. And may the name of the Lord be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.